And we are live in full 1080, allegedly, according to the thing that I clicked. I just noticed it said that one is on there. So hello, hello. And uh, I see people here. Thank you. Smash the like button. Absolutely. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up. How many of there's 50 of you concurrently as soon as I hit the button ready to go. Mm. I was uh, eating. So excuse me for a minute here. But just like it says there in the comments, I'm using StreamYard for those of you that wondering. <clears throat> I like doing this in StreamYard. It kind of makes it easier. So uh, just kind of makes it novel being able to do that. Tyler, you are building a PC as you listen. Awesome. Good to know. Cody, good afternoon, everyone. Awesome. Uh, what is the difference between an interface network and an address in the source destination dropdowns? Uh, one is the entire network. One is just the interface address. Uh, if you head over to the PFSense documentation under interfaces and or firewall rules specifically, and you can dive into that. So hopefully that will uh, help clarify those things there. Um, hello. I like when people tell me from where they're from. That's always fun. Hello from the Dominican Republic. Hello from Corey Thompson. Lots of people here. Awesome. Oh, I, I can only click so many. But let's see. I, I know you're in here all the time. So I believe, uh, is it Dunkel Aura? Is that how we say that? So I'm not positive. I get a lot. I don't say things right sometimes. So UP, as in Upper Peninsula, for those of you not familiar with Michigan, we, we have a lower and upper, well, technically we're peninsulas, as we, we show our hand in Michigan to explain our geography. <laughs> Makes it kind of fun. All right. Uh, lots of people, lots of people in here. Uh, did Greylog move the OVA? Yeah, I might do an updated video. They did remove the OVA, I think. Um, I, 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 someone pointed out it's not there. We can search for it. We will pull up a search window. Try to get my keyboard loose. So if we do gray log OVA and we gotta we gotta share right so if we uh we gotta share share screen a chrome tab yep i don't see it uh gray log supports docker so there is a docker you can do so there's docker but i don't see an ova anymore I built it from, you know, my video talks about building it from source or, and it's not that hard to do. They have configuration management, they have operating system instructions, uh, initial configuration. Um, it was relatively like, here's a step-by-step -step instructions and they weren't to me that difficult to follow. So I thought they were pretty reasonable. Um, this is their, their documentation. Actually, I thought was really good. J, I mean, granted, the SB and J from Learn Linux TV are relatively advanced Linux users, uh, but overall, I wouldn't rate this as um, something crazy high in terms of challenges of getting set up. And of course, the Docker instructions are probably easier. So if we look at the Docker one, yeah. So the Docker run, Mongo, quick start. So yeah. They have all of them here. They even have a manual setup instruction just to do everything manually. I recommend the package one because in my gray log server, I have it set up so you can um, just do apt get update and you can update to the latest versions. I updated recently to version 4.2 of gray log. Uh, I'm really happy with it. I haven't had any problems, but my, my feelings on gray log are still the same. I really love it. Um, it's definitely a lot of, uh, it's my favorite logging of all the different servers I play with for logging. It's definitely gotta be the one I like the best. Uh, do, 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 do. video went back to normal. <laughs> uh, let's see. 
Frozen video. Interesting. Uh, remember, Tom, Tom is a troll because he lives below the bridge. Oh, yes. The, I, I live below the bridge that connects the two peninsulas. I get it. So, yes, I am the troll beneath the bridge. <laughs> we'll go with that. Germany. All kinds of places. Um, but let's talk about the fun stuff, right? And um, how does this work? Let's see. How can I not do this in a way that would just go crazy? Stop sharing. Actually, if I drag this over here, then I say share screen. And I choose screen two. Then I can just drag things into screen two. And drag things. This doesn't belong in screen two. But this does. Where's this? Uh, where's the redacted? There's the redacted. I posted this on Twitter. Um, let me get it to 100%. Where's the 100%? That should be 100%. There we go. This is a screenshot with the IPs redacted. But this is the problem I ran into with... Uh, my, the, a weird configuration setting. As a matter of fact, let's talk about the configuration setting in Unify that we had to change to show this. This was um, overall just weird. <clears throat> so let me first log into our site, not a customer site. I can log into my home. Let's see. Tom's house. Tom's home. Um, there we go. There we go. Here's Tom's home. Now, where the problem lies, this is, we may have solved the problem. Riley Chase is looking into this as well. We may have solved the problem for Riley that he was uh, unable to solve as well. Somehow, the enable remote syslog server was checked on newer sites. And this is just really strange that only on the newer sites, the older sites, this wasn't checked. And we have a lot of sites in here for all of our clients. I think there's 60 different sites, 60 or 70. Anyways, this particular controller managed 60, 70 clients that are part of our managed services. And for some reason, and the this is the weird part over here, one site decided to go bananas sending that remote syslog data. Now we don't actually ingest the remote syslog data because if you turn this on, it'll want to send it back to the Unify controller. All these sites are remote. We don't need a bunch of syslog data floating across the internet back to us. We just don't need that data. If we do need the data for certain clients, you turn it on and then you set up a syslog server on-prem for that particular client. And uh, then that's how you solve that problem. Let me actually switch to another site that I think I have that set up for. Uh, yeah, our office. There we go. So our office has this set up. And we have an Able Syslog server, and we have a local IP address set up to have it go and send the data. So that's fine because it's sending it local. This is That's why it's got a local IP address in there where to send all the syslog data and we have it sent to port 1517. The default Unify port is 5514. And this is where we started noticing there was a bunch of, we don't open 5514 in our firewall, but there was a bunch of data coming in for 5514. Okay, that's strange. Then to go a step further, uh, one particular, one site with one device, they only had one device uh, that was doing this, this was a nano that sent 49 million over the course of two days messages, syslog messages. Uh, the next site, which was a bigger site, only sent 137,000 for that same time period. Now, we don't want any of them doing it. So we had to go in and check boxes to turn all these off. And it was just weird how it was doing it. We still don't know why the nano was doing it. We we haven't turned a, turned it back on or set up a local syslog server, but there's also no problems at the client to uh, indicate why it's doing it. 
the AP works, people are connected, and nobody's having a problem. So we actually don't know why it wanted to send that many syslog messages. We don't know what it was doing to make it send that many messages. Um, we just haven't gone back and investigated because we didn't want to knock the nano offline uh, because a bunch of people are connected to it. So it kind of like all you did was turn off syslog and a problem went away, but the nano itself works perfectly fine. There's no errors. Everyone's connected. So it's just kind of a weird investigation. Now, the other strange thing that happened because of all this, the volume of messages caused my syslog server to kind of ramp up. Now that doesn't trigger an alert because ramping up because more logs come in is just part of a daily routine. Sometimes there's more logs, sometimes there's less logs. So I was trying to think of, and I'm probably going to set up a threshold of just log count that if there's too many messages hit at once just to go check it, I just don't have that type of alerting set up inside of here yet. Um, my bad for not doing it, probably should have, but generally you don't think about it. If more logs come in, more logs come in. It wasn't it wasn't exceeding the amount of logs the system can handle, um, but it at least gave us some information. Now, one of the good things about all this, because we consolidate all of our logging to a singular place, by grabbing any one IP address, we can see everywhere that IP address interacted with us uh, as a company. We send all of our logs here, and this allowed us to cross-reference data, start understanding what it was really quick. Uh, at first, I didn't even know why it was so many things were trying to trying to hit 5514. Uh, <laughs> an interesting thing, anomalously random things try 5514, and I don't know why. Um, they just seem to send random data to it. So just kind of... Um, just kind of interesting overall how it was all working. So uh, that it, I don't know if this is a whole investigative video where I do it, or maybe I show more features of Greylog. The big problem with showing features of Greylog is trying to do a video on it is really hard because I have to constantly redact all the information out of it. So I may set up another Greylog server at my house, and uh, then I can... I don't care about the IPs at my house because I rotate my home uh, IP randomly. So maybe I'll set one up my house, send all the data to it, and that way I can walk you through what happens uh, in there. Or I'll set one up on a public uh, in a public internet and just kind of show all the things that hit like my web server, for example, um, for my website. So we host our website, LawrenceSystems.com. I could tie Greylog to that and it's all public data, whatever. Here's all the IPs that hit my website. And uh, maybe that might be an interesting video. So that's kind of the Greylog thing I was posting about, which is really puzzling when we were diving into it because what made all these systems... Um, default to on. We we do know right now if you create a brand new site in Unify, it defaults to sending that on. So now we have a note, create site, turn off syslog. But why only one site sent 49 million messages and the next site with a bunch of Unify access points only sent 137,000 uh, messages over the same period? And some of them just it goes down and some barely sent any messages. They just they even though other, we found other ones turned on, but they don't send they're very quiet. They don't send a lot of data. So kind of just a weird uh, experience overall for how that was going. I don't know. I thought it was thought it was a little strange, but I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, I know everyone's going to want me to do more gray log videos, and that part I'm fine with. Um, I, I agree with doing more gray log videos, but yeah. Um, what OS do you use? I am, am using Pop OS for my thing that I use uh, Debian Linux for. Uh, Debian Linux for all my servers for the most part, or Ubuntu. How do you calculate the price to manage customers AP switch in your controller? It's rolled into their managed services price. We don't give them a price to manage it. Uh, we only do it for um, the managed people that are in our managed services, people who are not. Uh, there's two ways I answer it because we we get this question a lot, and one is uh, we said if you want if someone wants to have their controller managed, no problem. We recommend Hostify. Hostify does all the management. If people say, and this has come up, people say, I want you, Tom, to manage my controller. You specifically, no problem. Just take Hostify's price and double it, and I'll, and I'll take care of it. Um, they, it's weird. People are looking for like a cheaper solution than Hostify. I, I don't do it at the scale Hostify does. So it's hard for me to beat their price and it takes a lot of work to do it. So if I'm going to do it, I have to charge at least what they charge and uh, or more. And generally I just charge more. Um, so that's kind of my solution for pricing. Oh, awesome. Now, one of the things 
about MSP pricing, and this is uh, this is also a really fun thing. That uh, just in discussion, the way I do it is the way I do it. It is not necessarily mean it is the only way. It, well, definitely not the only way, and it doesn't mean it's the only right way to do it. You have to figure out what works for you. And I've seen people who, you know, and I, this is completely, uh, this is my bill for um, a furnished problem, uh, HVAC problem we had here at the office. But I have seen MSPs with detailed billing like this, and the customers are never really um, thrilled to get super uh, detailed things like that. I don't know. Um, I, I, I prefer to keep my, my plan is always keep it very simple. We don't line item every little thing. We look at them as a holistic client. What are we going to manage? What are we going to manage for that client? What are we going to, uh, what are we going to unburden them with? And if we're going to take care of, you know, access points, switches and routing and make sure all the updates are done, we just kind of build it into the pricing structure for that client. Even if we're only giving them like a per computer price, because that's usually where the more expenses and in the big picture, we're throwing in kind of the management of the back end of it. But technically, as you may know, it's built into the price of their network. So that's, uh, yeah. Um, what do I think about Chris's newest video about the unified doorbell and pro in marketing? So the that the weird, cringy marketing, me and Chris talked about maybe three or four months ago when it first started. Uh, I was able to go on IMDb and find the people that they paid. Me and Chris had a discussion about uh, this. I was on the edge of whether or not I should do a video about it. I see Chris decided to, which is cool. But one of the things about the cringy marketing they did is um, I don't, it's like, do I bring attention to it? Or it, it, if you look up the Streisand effect, the problem is, do you bring more attention to the cringy marketing, therefore encouraging more cringy marketing, or do you ignore it? I don't know. I didn't know the answer at the time. Um, I decided not to. I think it's cool that Chris did the video on it, but it is a weird situation. Um, I thought about doing a follow-up on there because I, I didn't watch all of Chris's video. I only caught the end of it because um, he was doing a premiere and I caught it. I knew what it was about, though, because uh, me, me and Chris talk um, personally and, you know, great guy. But one thing about it is, like, I, I don't know what to, I think of all that cringy marketing. Uh, it's just strange. I don't know. Um, have you ever tested switches or APs from D-Link? I wouldn't use anything from D-Link uh, from their consumer side. I've never tested, I don't know if they make anything commercial, but I'm not a big fan of the, the consumer stuff of D-Link is just cheap D-Link stuff. So you have a two node XCPNG cluster. Want to add a third node as a cluster? Uh, witness, can I make a very small resource? Can I make it very small since it wouldn't actually be hosting anything? Yeah, I mean, you can, the, the pro, there's a couple issues though. You don't have to have a high resources to have the third device in the cluster, but, um, the lowest, the, the device with the lowest level of processor, uh, version is what everything will go back to. So, it's, um, it can end up, so if you have like a version, whatever old processor that only has this limited support, but other processors have other support, the, when you put them all in a cluster together, it goes to the settings of the lowest processor in terms of feature sets. So uh, be wary of that. Uh... What is your opinion using CAT6 across an office location environment where RF data scanning and leaking of data is a risk from RF scans? Uh, yeah, use, like Corey said, use fiber. Um, it, that solves it. Uh, but I, I'm sorry. I mean, I don't see if, if you were able to tap the data inside of here, like see the transactions through some type of, you're able to, you're, you're able to physically cut these wires, put something in to sniff it and watch the connection. What would you get? You would get some metadata for sure, but a lot of things are encrypted across the wire anyways. So it, your risk really is not with the wire. I mean, that is a 
factor, but the real risk comes down to what's the data transported across here? Is it encrypted? If the data is encrypted across here, then the risk is low. If you're using, you know, passing clear text type data through here and someone's able to somehow do this without breaking the connection uh, through some, you know, way of almost like uh, somehow they can tap into it and let's say do a port mirror, uh, the question really comes into is the data you're transporting encrypted? Because a port mirror doesn't solve the encrypted problem. It just gets a copy of the data. But if the data is encrypted, it doesn't matter. Uh, HA proxy tutorial. I already have an HA proxy tutorial. So go look at my channel. You'll find one. Uh, let's see. Use fiber. That's not, yeah. I actually people use fiber. Um, any personal capacity? Would you use WireGuard if it was not PF Sense? Um, WireGuard is convenient. It works. I have it on my phone. It's, uh, I, there's nothing wrong with it. It really has less to do. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really understand the question. It works. I like it. So I will use it. I do use it. So. What software do you keep track of all the updates and changes to servers and network equipment? Uh, we document the changes because we're the ones making them. We also have uh, enable RMM tool. So. I want to build a new TrueNAS box, specifically now that scale is a thing. I just don't know which HBA controller I should get. Uh, scale is definitely a thing. Scale is still a beta thing, so heads up on that. Um, go to their forums and look up Will It Free NAS. I, well, it's probably called Will It TrueNAS now. Uh, there's forum posts with a lot of them. I mean, if you were asking me for what we usually get, we like 45 drives or an IX systems, so... Uh, I don't know why you would do three or four machines as an HA CARP. I don't think it's supported. I think you can only have one. I There's probably some hacky way you can get more in there, but because they're not active-active, it's active and backup. Um, there's not a reason to put more than one. Um. I don't even recommend IDS for your home network unless you want to make a hobby of chasing down false positives. Um, so prob I mean, I use Terracotta, but not at home. I, it, it just, it's false positives most of the time and doesn't, um, yeah, it's a good learning experience. I recommend it for learning so you can get an idea of things, but it's not like a set it and forget it thing at all. Terracotta works good. Snort works good. Just comes down. I'm using Terracotta because I like it. If you prefer Snort, use Snort. I just found Cerakata seemed to work faster in PF Sense on the hardware I was using. Well, still even on the hardware I am using, but uh, that was like years ago. It may be the same on both of them now. Um, I don't know how it's handled and enable. I don't spend a lot of time in here, but I think you can get notices when things are uh, application is. Uh, removed or updated. I think there's a way to have it send you a notification. My staff does it, not me. So, so that's, uh, yeah, that's, you know, Enable has a lot of features, but that, that's not usually a problem we have to deal with. It's rare we're dealing with, oh my gosh, someone removed the program here. Uh, it would, as far as things that get open tickets for, I would say that would be extremely low. <laughs> uh, probably next week I had bought some of the cables that were in the video. They're in the other room. I was, uh, I put them in the thing, but I didn't, they're in my photo I took, but they're not here in my hand. I got other cables in my hand. Uh, I'm, I need to, um, I need to like do a lot of extra stuff to get the editing right on there. So uh, I, I shot a lot of video. I didn't, I got to come up with a narration and go over the video to put it together to make it a tutorial. 
So any way to quiet down HP DL3 pretty fans? Sounds like a Google search because I don't know. I have zero HP. Uh, I will admit, Jeff from Craft Computing did a great video on why HPs are stupid is what I would title it. Um, why some of them do require licenses to get updates and some don't require licenses to updates. Uh, I like the Dell servers a lot better. They're just easier to work with. And Jeff's video really hit that home for me. Um, it's 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 a long video where he explains the complexities of HP licensing and why some devices need licensing and some don't uh, to get updates and the history of all that. But either way, I don't do I don't work with uh, enough HP servers that I can tell you how to quiet the fans down. Um, you can use PF blocker to pull threat feeds, Corey. That's probably the best way to do that. I do like super micro servers though. The super micro servers are just more generalized. Um, the Dell ones are popular because of the warranty and things like that. But, uh, if, if I get the preference and this isn't always a uh, preference I get super micro, I just did a review on their, one of their servers. Theirs is definitely way better. I, I do really like that. Um, I don't know enough. I've seen very few Lenovo servers. Matter of fact, I almost have never seen them in the wild. So of all the clients we get, they pretty much have universally uh, Dell, really old HPs that we pulled out. I've seen HPs in a while, but we've never, re we always replaced them. We've never upgraded to a new one. Um, and I've seen a lot of super micros out there. So, but I've never seen, never seen a Lenovo in the wild, uh, it, which is weird. I mean, you'd think I'd run into them more, but for all the clients we've taken over, we rarely, I can't think of any client in, in our MSP uh, side of the house that we've ever had a Lenovo server that we did a rip out on. Super micro naming once you learn the nomenclature makes sense because each digit in letter means something. It's just not easy to say. But Corey likes Lenovo servers. I don't know anything good or bad about them. I just don't see them. Um, it, it's, I mean, we love Lenovo desktops and I love Lenovo laptops. They've, they've always been really, really good. Um, I, we've, we sell a ton of both of those, but when it comes to the other stuff, uh, I just, yeah, not much experience. I do know from talking to the team over at Tech Supply Direct, they rarely get anyone ever even requesting them. They get them from time to time, like they have some used ones. They told me they're just not a seller. They don't know why. They they just said they're not. No one seems to want them. They sell the most. The most they sell is all the Dell servers. One thing about all the Dell servers um, that makes them really convenient is it's so easy to go on eBay and find parts for them. Uh, because Dell has such a quantity of servers in the market, it's easy to go grab any parts you want for them. So that's, yeah. It's not a real Lenovo unless it has the mouse nipple. You're right. You got to have the little red dot on your ThinkPad. If you don't have the little red dot... <laughs> <laughs> yes we got travis in here uh tom has a pretty good idea of my fleet right now lenovo laptops nux for stationary workstations and dell servers yep we do travis <laughs> we help manage travis's fleet now i would actually think this makes sense to me lenovo server or maybe more in in uh, I, I think you mean just Europe, not Europa. Europa is different, but <laughs> uh, I would probably say it's true because I know at least a few of the YouTubers uh, that I've seen talk about Lenovo servers always seem to be based in Europe. Maybe just coincidence, but uh, yeah. What is the best business practice to replace your server four or five years in production? You know, a lot of times they only sell a five-year warranty on them and you probably want to make sure at the fourth year of your five-year warranty, you know when you're going to replace them. So um, that's, 
I'd say five year life cycle of server hardware, but I will admit we've seen them last longer because if the server load is really low, um, people may drag their feet a bit because they're going, it just stores a few files. It just connects us to Active Directory, but it really should after five years of continuous running, I'd say it's probably time to start considering a new one for sure. Um, Cause you have to, statistically it's gonna, it, once the warranty's out, how quick can that be fixed? And you're just playing the numbers of, well, after five years, the likelihood of failure has uh, certainly risen. Uh, what is being experienced with OpenZFS 2.0, OpenZFS 2.0 stability? Um, deployed some 8.4 boxes in the lab. Yes, ZFS working. Had to load the testing branch. I use all my ZFS in TrueNAS in production. Uh, so I don't have any problems with it in TrueNAS. So I can't really... Yeah. Uh... Make a second IT channel in... Oh, and like Legal Eagle and review IT scenes. I love Legal Eagle, but yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. There's enough people doing things like that. Um, We do have a ticketing system now. So thank you for the donation, by the way. Uh, I will call you Zoom Dust because I think that's how I pronounce that. Um, we don't have an actual PSA system. We have a ticketing system and we use an enable RMM. We're using fresh desk for ticketing. Uh, works well. Uh, we went to ticketing, but we still don't call everybody a ticket number. Uh, we still treat clients like clients. It, it's just what it became a problem, a scalability problem when we started doing all the consulting that we get from YouTube. There are so many consulting bookings at any given time. Uh, we need the ticketing system so the team can track all the inbound uh tickets because the tickets from our consulting that people book us from YouTube that comes all into the same system. And there's really not that much on our MSP side. That's actually really quiet. Uh, it's not our managed customers because when you manage everything, right, there's just less questions from those customers other than sometimes the printer doesn't work and the usual things that you expect. But yeah, people are still people at LTS. There you go. Take it from Brett Chittum. So I believe, I believe that Brett Chittum guy. Also, Brett runs all the stuff here. <laughs> I tried the ticketing systems that were integrated from like Enable, but yeah, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't really do it for me. Um, that's why we're, that's why we're using Freshdesk. Travis tries to keep it low man. Travis just has questions sometimes because he's always got projects he's working on and we're always happy to help Travis uh, up up his uh, tech game all the time. So are we a mentor for people that want to start their own business? I mean, you can hire us for consulting. That's the way I would uh, word that. We don't do web hosting, so I don't have any preference for, um, I mean, I like WHMC panel when I used to do hosting. I got out of the hosting business, so I don't have an opinion on it. I don't think, uh, I, I don't like anything that Microsoft makes. So my opinions are going to be very biased. I'll just say that up front. So my answer would be no, because I'm very biased against Microsoft's garbage. Um, I don't know. So no. The answer, their answer to me is I would say no. But if you, I mean, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying I'm biased. So I can't give you a strong opinion. I don't know anyone using Dynamics, so I actually don't have any real strong opinions on uh, how good or bad dynamics is. You know, I looked at OS ticket. I wanted to like it. I just really felt clunky compared to fresh desk. And, uh, it, oh, it, it's, it wasn't for me. And I, I'm a big open source advocate as people know, but it, I decided against it. So, um, it just didn't fit right with us when I played around with it. So I passed on that. Now, this is a tough one here. I'm trying to replace Google Photos with something self-hosted. Synology, is Synology the only off-the-shelf contender? For now, yeah, I would say yeah. I, 
I've been playing with it. I like it. I don't have an easy, there's a ton of little projects out there, but a lot of them are still in earlier development. None of them are like a solid contender. Some people will start throwing out next cloud with the photo management that may work fine too. Um, it's a lot, a little bit more in depth for doing it, but it's, it's doable off the shelf. The Synology photos just kind of works like that's turnkey, something I can recommend to the lower someone who doesn't have the technical skill to set up a server dedicated for something like Nextcloud. Uh, you want to buy an off the shelf Synology is something I can recommend to tech people who are less technical, but even does work for someone technical like myself. I have a Synology. I'm using one. I like it. So Dynamics is expensive and made for enterprise only. I've heard that repeated many times. I have no, I don't know anyone. Well, I can't say no one. I, the one person I remember was telling me about using it worked for a massive company. Um, we were just in a discussion about some other stuff and they were like, oh yeah, we use Dynamics, blah, blah, blah. And they didn't care for it, but they also work for a massive company. And that's my insight into it. Uh is TrueNAS scale? Yeah, whenever they get it out of beta, the the Gluster stuff is still in very beta, and the performance is terrible right now on TrueNAS scale. I guess the nightlies are better than the beta too, um, but so until things get closer to production, QNAP has a photo host too. QNAP also has lots of passwords buried in their system in back doors, so they're terrible about security on QNAP. That's my opinion on them. I, I'm not a fan of the QNAP. They have been very slow to respond to security things that security researchers point out of flaws in their system. So I'm not a big QNAP recommender. I know a lot of people use them. They're popular. They're pri they're priced right. Oh, let's see. G Suite removing unlimited storage. Of course they did. I don't know what the comment is on it. Of course they did. Someone someone did the math and goes, all right, this costs us too much money for the value it provides. So we're not offering unlimited storage. I mean, every, nothing's free. <laughs> it's just a matter of time before they make it not free. Uh, yeah, they're getting better. The new Synology, uh, what do they call it? The new Synology cloud management system they're, they're working towards. I forget what it's called now. Um, I talked about it in, the, in my seven, in my Synology seven video, but it's pretty cool. There are some things coming Synology that they're working towards getting a better centralized management system uh, compared to the old one. So Synology is definitely getting there. You can enroll in beta on it. Its name eludes me, but it's the new central management system on there. So have you tried Invoice Ninja V5? I did play with it. Um, but I didn't, I didn't deploy it yet. It's on my to-do list. I've actually met with the developer several times. I found some things that uh, when we copied all of our data over, had some problems. They fixed those problems. And I haven't. I just haven't copied it all over again and reset it back up. That's completely my fault. Um, but yeah, V5 is cool. Active Insight. That's the new one. That's the new one that they're looking for. You can sign up for a beta for free on it. I think they're going to keep it free. I don't have the, you know, the full, they don't, I don't think have the full layout of how they're going to do it. But most of the time the Synology stuff, uh, they give you so many things that you get to keep, you get to do for free because it helps them sell the hardware. That's a lot of how they work. Um, ah, the custom events are broken right now. Got it. Do I know if the unified switches use Mac sec? I have no idea. That's probably a better Google search than a Tom question. 
I don't know if they have that. I will I will go out on a limb here and say, though, you're going to probably find a lot of the Unify switches don't have certain advanced security functions like that. You're just not going to find it in a Unify switch. Do you prefer XCP and G over Proxmox? I definitely prefer XCP and G over Proxmox. Uh, what is a good open source inventory management asset management tool that can be used by an MSP to track the devices, specs given to users at different client locations? Now, we do this with Enable. Um, that's how we're managing it. But there is... this here that works as well. So let me, uh, this is snipe. Uh, what is the URL? Snipe it app.com is a uh, open source inventory management system. So snipe it security first, check it out. Features, demo, blah, 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 download support hosting. So this is a really popular, well-developed project where I've not used it. We don't use it. Cause as I said, we're using, um, we're using enable, which has inventory, but yeah, that's, that is an option of, if you're looking for an open source one. Uh, Google sheets for your assets. That works too. Ooh, if log center versus analogy, why gray log or not? There's, it's kind of like saying, do I want to ride a bicycle or do I want to ride in a uh, rocket ship? There's not even, they're, they're not on the same playing field. You can definitely collect some logs with Synology. Gray log is ex really extensive and made for, you can even build an entire cluster of log ingestion systems, processing, and everything else. You can kind of go crazy at an enterprise level with gray log. Um, so there's, it, it kind of, but it all just come down to your use case. If you just want to uh, have a few logs and put them somewhere, great. If you want to build triggers and correlation data and reports and automation and be able to handle logs at scale, for example, um, figure out why 49 million messages came from a single IP address and then track that back through the history. Graylog does a great job of that. Uh, that may not be something you can do as well with uh, the Synology Log Center. So Graylog is very, very extensive for logging. Synology offers logging, which is nice that they have that. And it's not a bad thing. Uh, it's just not as extensive of a log server. But it's still, if the options are go through the complexities or set up gray log, which may be more technical than you're willing to take on and you're not willing to dedicate a server to it, or check a box in Synology where you just turn it on and start pushing logs to it, I would say the Synology is certainly better than nothing and maybe adequate for your needs. Uh We can bring this up. People asking what we use. This enable. This is uh, what we're using for our tooling. So they have why enable the studio partnerships, blah, blah, blah. Where's, they have screenshots and demos. Here's the RMM. Learn more. It's all pretty and got graphics. And yes, it's got these cool menus and everything else. Get a quote, try it for free. Yeah, that is what it looks like. It's kind of got this really simple. All of our clients are down one side and uh, all the sites are over here. So that that's what we're at. It's a nice system. Like I said, it's what we use. You're biased because you're an engineer at Snare. What is Snare? Snare logging tool? I've never heard of it. Is Snare open source? Uh, 
So here, we'll look at it together here. Uh, try snare free product, free trial. Oh, I got to accept some cookies. Okay. Not heard of snare, but cool. Awesome that you work there. Enterprise collection and log management. I like Graylog because it's open source. Um, that's a huge selling point to me on it. It's open source. It's something that any of you, provide you have the technical knowledge to do so and have a server to load it on or a virtual server, however you prefer, um, you can get a hold of Graylog and get started with it. It's I, I like I said, I, I do like Graylog. So that's, I love open source tools. I don't mind paying for open source tools either. Uh, Graylog does offer paid support. And that's kind of me a good combination of a company that you can get it in the hands of a lot of people to try out. You can try it all out yourself. And if you go, you know what? I like this. I actually like to... Uh, pay them for their expertise. You can do that too. Oh, no problem. Hopefully this helps. So hopefully this helps with your log management decisions. <laughs> it's not an easy one. Um, I don't know how to answer questions like this. How steep is the learning curve for Greylog? It took me a little while, so I made, and I made a video on it to help people understand it. I didn't find it. I, I don't know how to rate things. That's very, very difficult for me. Uh, it seems like it's really well documented to get set up and learn. I made a walkthrough. Uh, Jay set it up in 10 minutes. It took me a little bit longer than 10 minutes to set it up. Um, I, but maybe if you're less technical, it may take you a couple hours to grab to get all the grasp of how it works. Uh, I, how difficult it is, like I said, not easy. So, uh, YouTube doesn't randomly do it. If you post a link, you get yeeted. <laughs> so, so that's as simple as that. <laughs> if uh, don't post links. They, they definitely yeet all the links, so. Uh, great. If you're referring to Greylog, there is, they have an Ansible chef and puppet uh, options. So they actually have, their documentation is pretty solid. Um, I never tested NetBox because I don't really have a need for it. So, no. I know what it is. I looked at it. So, uh, yeah, Grafana Loki is cool and open source. The only problem I've ever run into, and hey, True Charts, you guys are great. Yeah, True Charts, if I'm, uh, I'm assuming this is the actual True Charts channel, uh, they, they do, uh, I covered this in FreeNAS Scale, how you can add extra, uh, Helm charts, I think is the right term, right? Make sure you get terminology right, uh, to have extra things. And among there are Grafana and Loki. Some of the problems I've run into it is uh, they are cool to get going, but they seem to break on update, at least my experience was. But they're definitely a, a great projects that I, I, they're probably better than when I tried them a while ago. Hey, awesome. This is the official Two Charts Maintainer account here. Um, and th this looks really promising because uh, if, this is why, oh, Loki's not in there yet? Okay. Well, eventually, I know you, I, I feel confident the True Charts people and other community developers are probably working on that, so. Uh, do you disable Windows Telemachy? Never trick my script for it. I'm thinking about testing it. No. I mean, no one's asked us to, so uh, we don't. Grafana, neither hope to get... Uh, okay, yeah. That's awesome. You guys are working on Grafana as well. Got a fly in here. Getting more logging tools out there. Now, you know, this is a really good use case as well. So uh, TrueNAS, being that it 
as a storage oriented server, being able to run things. Uh, and by the way, I, I think this is kind of interesting. Let's go ahead and pull this up. Uh, let me switch to another screen. There we go. Uh, inside of here, plugins. I haven't tested this yet, so I'm just I'm just letting people know I seen it. I saw it. Saw it. Saw it. The right word. I seen it or saw it. So let me clear this. I like this too. Uh, inside of here, Graylog. Now, this is TrueNAS Core. I don't have a scale system currently in, in use. I reverted my a system that was running scale back to core. But I want to point this out. Um, Running your logging system inside of here makes a lot of sense because one of the challenges with logging is where to put all the logs. The logs are big, and I like to put them all on the TrueNAS server. So if you can run, you know, on scale a Docker instance or on core a, a BSD jail that also has a spot to put all of your logs on the same system, that's great. So I think this is really cool that uh, these are options within here. Uh... Actually, while I'm here, I was R syncing things. Okay, it's still going. I'm migrating data. I, I might do a video about this because I ran into some problems in the pool. We're consolidating a bunch of things. I'm getting rid of all my stuff that's legacy encrypted. So I may do a video about dealing with that. The quickest, easy way is to just R sync data from one spot to another. And it's got 300 gigs of pull, data pulled in there. There's two of these because I'm also working on a video with AutoFS. I am working on some new great log videos and I'm working. I know a few people have asked about AutoFS. I can't tell. Well, at first I was like, I couldn't tell if AutoFS was stupid or I was stupid. And the answer is yes. Tom didn't know how AutoFS works and AutoFS sometimes requires rebooting a system, which makes it stupid. Uh, even Jay had the same problem with AutoFS. So I'm working on some automatic logging stuff and automatic file mounting things. It was silly. So... Uh, can you show how you detect uh, disk trash in true and Synology? I'm curious to, I don't, I don't understand the question. Uh, let's see, I'm going through. What do you use to smack users through screens? We don't. Yeah. The um, Craft Computing does have, he does have a, a I think him and both, uh, what's the other guy? Chris Titus have some decrapification tools for that. I need to learn a logging tool just for the sake of learning. Yes. Uh, you know what? Honestly, I mentioned it earlier. This You have Synologies, Travis. So, uh Turn it on. It's an easy way to start consolidating your logs and sending things over there. Um, it's built into Synology. You have Synologies, so. Uh... Yeah, that's true too. Don't put too much weight in your network wall rack. Um, you have to really secure that well, that's for sure. Uh, what else do we have in here? Disk thrashing? Um, oh, oh, that's what you're asking about with disk, disk thrashing. It's, you look for high load on servers uh, if that's the issue. It's a load issue. I don't care how much a disk thrash. Is the server able to keep up with what's being thrown at it? So... Um, Hopefully that makes sense. I really, I mean, Synology has like that threshold. I've never turned it on because we never needed it. Um, Synology does have like an alert threshold if it's got too much, uh, if the resource pool re exceeds certain values, I think it can send you an alert. 
Um, do a video on Synology Log Center. Here's the thing. Let's do this. Uh, five. Just log into my Synology. <laughs> Recursion. <laughs> uh, remind me later. Package Center. There's really not much to it. So I don't know. Logs, archive settings. It's really not much to it. Log receiving, create. You know, name, test. Where it's coming in, TCP, UDP. If you have any parsing rules, uh, and then send the data. It's not not terribly. Uh, oh, please stick, select the storage. Okay. I got to create a place for it, but. Either way, it's it, you set it up, you start receiving logs. There's really not much of a tutorial, and, and I tested it, and it worked. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll maybe I'll do a video and talk about it some. Yes, yeah, see, so, so, uh, Signology Monitor has all kinds of things that will monitor. I've never had one exceed the threshold, other than when I was purposely trying to overload it. But yeah. XCPNG. I've answered this earlier. And I'll answer it again. XCPNG. I, that's my favorite hypervisor uh, system. Um. Yeah. Well, kind of an interesting attack vector is yes. In if a if a system is public facing and there's a way to get into it and then overload it, it is definitely a potential problem that could be created. Uh, I haven't really looked into how scale does this, but I know there's ways to do this in Docker in general is limit the amount of resources that it can potentially take over. So uh, let's see. Does Synology have a dark mode? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe. Can you theme a Synology? Is there a theme option? I've never looked. Doesn't look like it. Maybe you can, I don't know, maybe there's something. Portal info. Oh, there's a theme. Look at that. So here. There are some theme options. Template. You can probably upload different ones, wallpapers. That is the dark theme. Maybe you can add different themes. This is the darker theme for Synology, so for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, yes, the apply re... Oh, this is good. So... Yes, there are re good. This is good that by default, there's resource limits. That way that gives you the option. One, you're not going to overload the system by default. Two, you got the option to fine tune it if you need more or less resources for that. So. Uh, can you back up virtual machines in Zen Orchestra to an NFS share? Yes, you can back them up to NFS or you can back them up to um, SMB. Both are supported. In the world of XCPNG, it's referred to as your remotes. So here's your remotes. There is my uh, production backups, and there is my lab backups. So, but if you want to create a new moat, you can create an S. Uh, this is in beta still, but you can also create an SMB remote for backup. I have a whole video on uh, backups in here and how they work. Uh, 
Someone asked about WireGuard. Yes, I've been working on this for a while. I, I just turned this one off, but I have all these extra VMs that I'm working in in here. So that's uh, more fun things coming. I just got to sit down and get to that. I like this look. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Do NFA share have I notify asking because that's going to be, I don't know. Hopefully, um, Ah, this is, you know, this is an important thing to think about too. This is where you can get yourself into trouble and why in the uh, enterprise environments we deal with, we don't see as many jails or um, containerization of applications. The storage servers are usually dedicated for storage because this is a risk of, you know, you've seen some containers with memory leaks or CPU overload and be honest, it's not funny when it starts to affect the house. For a lot of our commercial installs, they're going to be dedicated just for storage. And although it would be convenient to run other things on them, people don't because it would cost possibly cause problems and they don't want problems. They are looking for usually the utmost stability first and performance second uh, when you build these systems. So <laughs> when you get over hundreds of containers, you start noticing certain things more and more. Yes, you find the same developer does the same mistakes repeatedly. Can you pass through your GPU uh, Windows VM? I would say Proxmox is easier. But yes, PCI pass through supported. It's documented. It's all done from the command line. I think Proxmox has a menu to do it. There is no menu to do it in here. Well, fuzzy. If you have one of the commercial GPUs in Zen Orchestra for a particular host, I think, yeah, I don't have one. Um, there's ways to set path through up if you have like one of the ones that support SRIOV. I think it's SRIOV. Either way, yes, there's possible ways to do it under circumstances if you have one of the... Um, if you look for uh, Zen GPU compact. If you go here, pass through GPU, apply filter. Like the AMD Fire Pro supports pass through. Actually, we'll select. There. So yes, your Tesla M6 P100s. It's funny because Tesla P100 is also the P100D is the actual model number of Tesla. So uh, yeah, there's a few things in here. There's There are ones that are built into support, but if you just want to do PCI pass-through, they have a write-up on how to do PCI uh, pass-through right here. So that's their documentation is really... It's getting, it's not 100%, but they've got a massive amount of things documented in there, how to do them. Uh, can you change the management port for another NIC and dedicate another for, yes, absolutely. As many as you want. Yeah, you can, it, you can have, um, you can choose what does what. We have lots of network cards in here. You can dedicate different things for different management. And you see how this one's actually dedicated to management. And then there's all the other ones that can be specified. You can change which one's dedicated for what. So you can even build private networks out. You can, in the pool itself. You can set up all the different networks. I label them not in use because that's easier. So so the ports were not, we have more ports on our system than we're even using. But yes, so the answer is that is all stuff you can definitely do. 
All my patches are applied. Oh, yeah. That's, I didn't clear that log. That's forever ago. So, cool. Uh, let's see. So, there's general rule for determining number of VMs for an XCP and Genius resources it has. Um, and he's in needs. So, that's, you know, just uh, give things the amount of resources they need to get the job done. Uh, let me look at something here. Let me find something. Here's something over here. Pull this one back up. This is a project one of my staff is working on, you know, it's, it's a windows 10. It's for a client and, uh, he, my, uh, we're working on some auto install scripts for a specific application. The client has, we only gave it four cores and six gigs of Ram because that's all it needs. So there's not like a rule of thumb as much as you give it the resources it needs to get things done. This has a really small hard drive on it because it doesn't need more. It's just, we're, we're erasing it with a snapshot and, uh, yeah. Testing scripts and install guest tool testing PowerShell scripts. So Kyle's created a couple instances here where he can just revert back because I know he's the one working on this. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty, it, you don't, there's not like I said, there's you, you look and if something's underpowered, here's my uh, Unify server. I don't think it needs more CPUs. Uh, it seems to have plenty of RAM. It's not using, it's using five gigs out of 16 gigs assigned. But I have 16 gigs, so I assigned 16 gigs to it. It's not exceeding any uh, thresholds here. I do have eight cores. I seems like enough. And uh, yeah, if I needed more, if I think something's out of memory, I just bump the memory up. It's not. It's not to me that big of a deal on there. Uh, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. There's not an easy. It, it depends on use cases. Um, kind of, there's the new, um, what's it called? Let me log into it real quick. The, uh, there is a management tool they're working on. It's not fully out yet. True command. So pull this up for you or not. Let me just find a page on it. There we go. Manage all your TrueNAS server fleet from one place. That's that's what this is for. So, yes. The answer is there is a management interface for it. Hopefully that helps on that. Um, I'll give us 10 more minutes. I've been doing this for a little over an hour, about 10 more minutes, and then I got to take off. And I'm out of water. I need something to drink. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't tried True Command lately. When I tried it, it was still in beta. Uh, I was an early beta tester. I think it's pretty cool. I, I don't really need it. So that's my thing. But I guess if you have a lot of them and you want to monitor them, it might make sense. It's also now this is also going to be where I'm going to definitely try it again is what Chuchar said here. True, uh, the true command is going to handle the Gluster multi node. So that's definitely a um, definitely something that is going to be, uh, I have to readdress it because that's how they plan on handling uh, deploying Gluster. It's more like active insights for Synology because it's a monitoring and some configuration management and consolidation of logging. So 
uh, kind of, but yeah, I guess you could say it's, very, it's similar to CMS and Synology. All right, rapid question time. What other questions do you have in the last few minutes before I wind this down? Any more? I, what else I had in the list here? Um, gray log, Synology. We talked st storage. Yeah, I think we covered the things I was talking about. Um, I was going to rant. I don't know if it's worth the video. Maybe and Brett will bring it up because we're bidding on some stuff at a school. But what I bid on and what I don't bid on is one of those... Um, I don't like bidding on like commoditized stuff. So I like when someone says, I here's the exact specs or I want to buy, I want the best deal on licenses for VMware or something like that, which is part of a bid process that a, that a school district has. And we just pass on those. And I was explaining to Brett why. So we're just kind of talking about like, it really comes down to um, like who wants to make the least amount of money on a project wins the bid. When there's nothing in it, um, when there's nothing interesting going on in a bid, like it's just going, we want to take this commoditized thing. We need to renew the licenses on it and schools for reasons we don't always understand other than paperwork and bureaucracy won't buy things directly. Uh, so they reach out to third party vendors cause that's part of their process. And they just say, who's going to give me the best price on VMware licenses. And it's kind of like, those are, I don't know. I thought about talking about that type of bidding. I just usually skip it and avoid it. Um, but yeah, uh, we didn't dive into not on this time, my upcoming video, I will be talking about some of the synology stuff coming up though. I've never used the, uh, BGFS, so I don't have an opinion. <laughs> Any tips for time management? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, it's hard. I don't know. I don't have any good answers for it. Just put everything in a calendar. That's how it happens for me. If I don't schedule it, it doesn't get done. So I put everything in a calendar. Hire someone to do paperwork. That's That's actually my best advice would be hire someone to do paperwork. Hire the things you don't want done. Four MVME drives, next CPNG host. Awesome. Uh, I think I like Tesla. I am still happy with my Tesla. So my answer is kind of a yes on that. I, I think so. I like Tesla, but that's my opinion. I just took my Tesla up north. It was nice up north. And uh, yeah, I, I've had it for uh, a couple of years now. It's got like 40,000 miles on it. I'm happy. I'm still happy with it. So <laughs> where do you find opportunities to bid on? Someone told me about it. Um, it's not easy to find the opportunities to bid on it, but they're also they're not that great. A lot of times they're just looking for the lowest price on things. So we might look at some of it and this is, Oh yeah. You had to go through the E-rate process to get a grant for funding for the government. It's basically a race to see who can do it for the worst, cheapest, giving any requirements, no fun at all. Yes. This and all of this, what Tyler said, gone through the E-rate process in order to get a grant for funding from the government. And it's basically a race to see who can do it for the worst or cheapest. Yes. That right there. So, hey, thank you for the donation. Evening, considering a Synology NAS, but want to upgrade to uh, RAM to 18 gig is an unofficial RAM upgrade okay? I've always gone with the official one. We, we, I, well, I'll take that back. We have put other non-Synology memory in as long as the Synology supports the memory, and we haven't had problems. Um, it, so it should work fine. Yes, and says someone else here. Synology works fine as long as the RAM is compatible. Yeah, I generally find uh, that works. Yeah, unofficially works with quality RAM. Buy a good brand name, and I think you you should be fine. 
I mean, all Synology is doing is certifying that a particular brand works for them to avoid some trouble tickets. So. I have a whole video on how to use HA proxy. So yes, I've used proxies. I use, I use it and we use for, uh, we've set up projects with HA proxy. And that's not true. Wait a couple years. So this is a myth that people like Dunkel here is uh, promoting. The reason Synology has specific drives in their performance series is because when people buy them on their high-end ones, they expect a certain performance. If you wanted to buy a TrueNAS system from us, right from IAC Systems, like an M20 or something like that, you don't get to pick the hard drives. You get to pick the size, not the drives. Because if you have a specific performance requirement and want a warranty with it, you will get the drives dictated to you with the guarantee. Uh, that's actually pretty common, and it's the only way companies, because there's so many shenanigans going on with the hard drive companies, that this is how they guarantee it. It's not, they're not trying to stop people from putting their own drives in. They want people who have want performance guarantees to be fulfilled will have to get certain drives that have been certified for those performance guarantees. If you didn't read about the recent shenanigans of the bait and switch, all the hard drive companies were, well, not all, but a handful of hard drives companies were participating in, this is a real problem when people buy a $10,000 high-end Synology and it doesn't perform the way they expected. And after some investigation, you find out the hard drives aren't performing as spec because parts got switched. So, yes. Uh, in, hold on. This, and here's an example. If you look this up, there was a bunch, there was more than just the, this, but Western Digital switching customers with slow SSDs. There was a, they changed what chips from the review to the ones they sent out to people without changing the SKU to let people know something was different. These are real problems if you're a, a storage provider and you want to guarantee a certain level of performance and, and people just want to buy whatever drive. The drives you may have tested in your lab to uh, get the performance numbers so you could tell a customer, but then the customer buys something else that didn't come through you to be tested, uh, these are problems that the, uh, see, here's the problem. The manufacturers are able to see these problems and may not understand them, like manufacturers like Synology. This is common though with uh, other enterprise equipment where you don't get to pick the drives. This is why they do it on their performance ones. It's not something you're likely to see <clears throat> show up everywhere, but yeah. And it's more than just SMR. It's, it's actual uh, changing out of product with different parts. Yeah, so with a lot of companies doing all that fun stuff uh, with hard drives, I, I, you're, I don't know that you're going to see more of it in the future, but you'll see it on any time someone wants to have a performance guarantee. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of issues out there in hard drive world. So... All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks everyone. Uh, if we can get a few more likes on the like buttons here, actually, we'll we'll drag this over. The last thing I'll do is is uh, shill for likes here. So let me um, add to stream. There we go. 180 people. Let's watch the likes go up at least a couple times. <laughs> There's. Oh, uh, let's see. Fun fact, I drive past Seagate HQ daily. Awesome. Oh, good. We got a few more likes. All right. So, so my shilling was not for nothing. 
Hey, all, we're looking forward to charts. Uh, glad to have you on the live stream today. We're looking forward to, you know, uh, the development of scale. I'm definitely excited. Yes, it's time to go have pizza with the family and do stuff like that. That's my next step. So thanks everyone for joining. See you next time. Hit me up on the Twitters, hit me up on the forums and uh, fun stuff like that. And I'll keep cranking out videos. Take care. End broadcast.